الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القاعلون ولا يحصي نعمه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتحدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله أعداهم أجمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنحدينهم سبولنا وإن الله لمع المحسنين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله محمد وعلى محمد بليس Our discussion has been revolving around a life of detachment and this is our third discussion on that topic and the attempt from day number one was to move away from a little bit of the, the, the classic discussion on Zuhud and really talk about this Maqami discussion that we had on the first night now on Saturday I think it was. Saturday? Saturday. Where we used a line from Ziyarat Ashura where we said, وَلَعَنَ اللَّهُ أُمَّةً دَفَعَتْكُمْ عَنْ مَقَامِكُمْ That may Allah's mercy be removed from that nation, from that ummah, who brought Hussein down from his maqam. And ulama now have done discussions on this shara, this Ziyarat Ashura, said maybe the biggest moment of dhulm or oppression done to Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura was the fact that it was done to Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura. Beyond the water, beyond the bloodshed, beyond the, the horses and the, and the swords, was the fact this was Imam Hussein. This was someone the Prophet referred to as Minni. He's, he's from me. And so when the maqam is higher, the dhulm also becomes a little bit more tougher to bear. And we segue that into the idea that sometimes we don't understand our own maqam our own level in the eyes of Allah, in the eyes of our own self. And we live a life, we make decisions, we attach ourselves to those things that are perishing in this world. In the process, we, with our own hands, lower our own maqam, our own worth. By actually believing that by possession of materialistic things, I could be somebody. I could achieve a status. I could be somebody who is respected by those around me. And we end up now <clears throat> blurring the lines between those things I should attach to and detach from. When you get these two mixed up, it becomes, it becomes a very difficult life to live. Someone like me thinks I'm going towards prosperity, towards success, and when I reach a certain age in my life and I look back and I'm hoping to have that certain level of respect or maqam or, 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 or station and I don't, it's very hard to go back and recapture those years. And so we have to understand a little bit of the idea of defining the proper term of detachment. And that brought me to last night where I talked about the idea that in the Islamic world, Spirituality is not found on the top of mountains or inside the caves or in basements that only a, a specific few can go to or in centers that only are there by invite only, for example. Spirituality is found within the masses, in this world, during your nine to five, talking and speaking with those around you. Spirituality is found at no frills. It's found in the mall. It's found traveling with your family. It's found in the mahrab as well. 
The command is not to climb the highest peak and disassociate with your, your, yourself with everybody else and find Allah there. That might be a little bit easier. The kamal and perfection and pinnacle of the believer is to find God amongst these distractions. To ward off those distractions. Or maybe to use what might be a distraction to springboard towards Allah. We talked about Nabi Suleiman's dua yesterday. Give me a kingdom unlike any other. Li ahdin min ba'di. That there's no one like this after me. I mentioned why that dua was. It's not the idea that Islam doesn't want you to possess things. It's that those things shouldn't possess you. Your level, your self-worth, your value, your maqam cannot be measured by dollars and cents or square footage or the latest model of whatever car you might have or what you're wearing on your feet or what you have around your shoulder in a purse. If we have that level, if we think actually I'm going to gain some respect and actually call myself somebody who's earned something, we're setting ourselves up for a disastrous hereafter. We haven't gotten this world and we definitely won't get that world. Those are my two nights so far. Tonight, the question is why? Why can't we see ourselves the way that God sees us? Why do we need to chase the dunya? One very important point from last night extremely crucial from last night was the fact that when you begin to identify the proper means by which to attach yourself to and detach yourself from I mentioned last night that nobody jumped on the Titanic as it was sinking everyone jumped off the Titanic why we would attach ourselves to a perishing fleeting world is beyond me I talked to myself up here wallah but when we identify that he is baqa, I want to be baqi, I'm going to attach myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In, in, in exchange of that, in response to that, he does something profound and beautiful, like a graceful be, uh, creator should do. He says, now that you attach yourself to me and detach yourself from those things, I'm going to grab those things that you detach from and place them at your feet. You detach from fame and fortune, detach from money, you don't want that, you t attach yourself to me, you sacrifice all that, I'll bring the dunya to your feet. I mentioned Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salli ala. When a, a believer lives a life of hawaya ala hawahu, a God says in his hadith al Qudsi, when they choose my desire over their desire. When they live a life like that, Allah says, one effect of that, I will bring the dunya, the world, to your feet. There are those that chase the dunya, there are those that are chased by the dunya. And when you attach yourself to the, to the appropriate eternal source, those detachments come and they follow you. The difference is that now, they have no value towards you. Because you've attached yourself to that, that which is eternal. These things now become useless. That's why Amir al-Mu'mineen has a beautiful statement. You've heard it a thousand times from me. That when your level of worth increases, your disdain for your desires also increases. Only because you realize those carnal, satanic desires inside of me are not meant to give me pleasure, they're meant to what? Bring me down from my maqam. It hurts to watch Imam Hussein go through that on the day of Ashura. It breaks our hearts, because he's Hussein. It should break your heart also, break my heart also, that I am God's creation, I'm God's servant, and I choose to label my self-worth by some brand name on my car or brand name on my purse. We're a little bit above that. We have to get to the point where we can achieve those things. We can own those things, possess those things. I can have a house 10 times that size, Asabai. No problem. If I, try, if, 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 if I cheat, if I lie, if I steal, if I close my eyes and invest in the wrong companies, no problem. I can be a millionaire. I choose not to. Because I'm not at that level. I'm higher than that level. So the Kamal is, like I said, to be inside this world and to find Allah within these distractions. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And I'll, I'll never forget my, I, and I, I think I mentioned the story here, if not at least at JCC, 
my first summer after the Hausa. So I left Toronto June, if my dates are right, June of 2004. I spent two months in India. From India, I went to Iran. Okay. I spent 10 months of the academic year there, and our flight back was late June. So a full 12 months, I've been away from Toronto, 2004. I had hair back then, mashallah. Nice black beard. Hi, hi. Masaib jaldi shuru ya Allah. And I was a little bit apprehensive. Because you know, when you, <laughs> it's a joke, that actually Mlana Rizvi has a beautiful joke. He says, the first year houses students, they think they're God when they come back, right? They think they're God when they come back. After a couple of years, they realize that they're nothing but a servant. So I thought I was God, of course. You walk in, on what, what's going to happen? How am I going to, how am I going to integrate back into Toronto? Oh my goodness, this high, that high. You know, you turn on channel three on my television. Do I come in, for example? You're walking past, you know, Aytul Nasser Makaram Shirazi's Darsi Akhlaq on loudspeaker. You can walk in and sit. I mean, Rouhani at every corner of the globe, and every corner of that city. In line for, for, for non, in front of you Rouhani, behind you Rouhani. Driving past you on a motorcycle, three Rouhanis going towards class. Three Amamas going to class. All you see is libas, libas, libas everywhere. And now I'm coming back to the city. And I asked my teacher, what do I do? And he starts laughing, aren't you from that city, he says? I say, yeah, I am. Because it's, I mean, these are not strangers of yours. I go, I'm afraid that I might, you know, this, this, this high I'm on, this spiritual high I'm on. So he see, always said one thing to me that stuck to me. This is 2004 now. He says to me that when you reach a level where your iman is not bound by your geographical location, that's when you've achieved something. The high you feel right now, if you feel that high in Toronto, then that's a maqam you've, you've earned. And sometimes you have to be in that to earn it. We're not hiding, we're not running a lot of people ask me, Mulana, I want to you know, take my kids and go to Iran and live there. You know, I said, the same issues happen over there. I want to go to Pakistan. I don't know if that's, that, that's the best call. It's not the idea of running. How, this dunya has become so small. How far are you going to run? We have to run from our nafs, not run from our city. We have to be able to understand what it, is, what it means to be a mu'min and somebody who is a mujahid. Because Allah now compares two people very quickly. The mujahideen and the qa'ideen in the Qur'an. And my young guys out there who are on the front lines now struggling every single day. Please, very carefully. A mujahid is one who does jihad. Jihad in the sense that he struggles against himself. Or a mujahida, mashallah, my amazing sisters. Every single day, they struggle to be a better person. Their yesterday is a little bit less than their today. A qa'ideen is somebody who sits and does nothing. There are people now who either are complacent or they're comfortable with where they are or they've convinced themselves the amount that I've done is good enough. I'm not going to be better. The way it is, it is. That's it. You can't teach, uh, you know, and so it's a horrible statement, you can't teach an uh, old dog new tricks. So I'm going to just sit and whatever I know, I know, and I hope for the best in the hereafter. Or there are people who simply don't want to learn anything else. The deen is in the hands of the ulama, and that's it. I don't have any responsibility. If I fail as a, as a, as a, as a believer, it's because of the pulpit, not because of me. That's who? The qa'ideen. They sit. They do nothing. No passion, no motivation to do anything. They have hearts, nothing really travels deep inside that heart. There's no fiqhi discussion, there's no deep amik discussion inside of them. They're okay with surface levels. Those are the qa'ideen. Allah says, is there a difference between them, between two? Absolutely. The mujahid has an ajrun azim waiting for him in the hereafter. So it's not like God doesn't see your struggle, guys. It's not like God, not only does he see your struggle, acknowledge your struggle, he rewards your struggle. There are some of my young guys who says, Asabai, do my parents see what I'm going through? Do you guys on the members see what us as 19, 20 year olds are going through? And we don't, I'm not with you all day long. But who cares if I see it? God sees your struggle. God knows how hard it is on campus, let's say. The weather warms up and your eyes have to be glued to the ground. I could, I could buy whatever I want to buy. I choose not to be a walking billboard. It's a struggle, especially when you're accepted as a walking billboard. You might have more respect. 
You might have more friends, but you do it fi sabilillah. You are a mujahid in the eyes of Allah. Ajrun azim waiting for you. That's the beauty of God. There are some people who will never see how hard you work. There are a lot of my sisters who are mothers who are full time, they work full time, look after the home. The meal is cooked, the house is spotless, right? They're raising three kids, they're raising a husband. It's Labor Day, right? We should acknowledge the labor. And then sometimes they think, I don't think anybody sees how hard it is. And you're right. If you're waiting for your husband or your mother-in-law or your mother or someone to acknowledge your, your efforts, you may be waiting your whole life. But Allah sees you as a mujahid. And over a qa'id, you have a azim ajr waiting for you. The point is, I know it's hard, Baba. I'm not claiming that it's not hard. Everything I've said for two days is easier said than done. No doubt about that. But there's a maqam, there's a station all of you have earned in the eyes of Allah. We'll talk about it today a little bit. That cannot be at the price of some materialistic, tangible object. You hear these ahadiths all the time. When the first imam says that if you're going to sell your soul, it's got to be at a price higher than Jannah. If you can find anything in this world higher than heaven, sell your soul out. Because I've always said this, and I'll say it again, and my young guys have to hear this, and please tell your kids this. Heaven is the rule. The hellfire is the exception. Heaven is the rule. The hellfire is the exception. You really have to be a horrible human being to be the fuel inside the hellfire. You belong to a merciful Lord to the point where he'll take anything from you. Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ala Muhammad. Adabu salat, Imam Khamenei rahmatullah alayhi has a whole discussion on the bahjat of a, of a prayer. And in there he quotes a, quotes a tradition. He says, there are moments where Allah will accept one-tenth of your salat. One-tenth of it. Sometimes one quarter of it, sometimes one half, sometimes three quarters, sometimes all of it. Now glass half empty means, oh great, only one tenth of my salat will be accepted. What's the point? Because we live in an all or nothing era, right? Either go big or go home. There's no point in doing anything half. Do it full or forget it. That's why a lot of my sisters who take off their hijab, like, you know what, Milana, I'm, I don't want to be hypocrite. I can't figure it out, so I'm going to take the whole thing off. No, Bob, let's not start there. One tenth also means glass, glass half full, meaning what? I will take even 10% of your salat. That's all you're giving me. Allah does not work in entirety in terms of all or nothing. If one hour of your salat in the month of Ramadan is for him, he'll take that one hour. I mean, he's obsessively trying to make sure that all of you get into heaven. It's the rule. You were not created to burn in hell. And the faster my young guys get that, the faster they'll kind of detach themselves from this titanic of a world. So that's been my discussion for the past two days. 20 minutes of nothing but summary and muqaddama. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now come to tonight's discussion. The story of Adam and Shaitan. Adam and Satan. Classic story you find in the Bible, you find in the Torah, you find in the Quran. The summarized trailer version of the story is that God creates Adam, tells Shaitan to bow down, he doesn't. Right? End of story. There's a lot more to it. And those small details that sometimes, not that we leave out, but the, that, that the Qur'an does not mention, we have to go a little bit in different sources to really complete the story, are crucial elements of the story. Before even creating the human being, God tells the angels and the jinn what his plan is. Okay? No surprises. I'm going to create this human being with three elements inside of him or her. One is thin, clay, mud, however you want to say it. 
One is something called taswiya. Wa iza sawaituhu. One is wa nafaktu fihi min ruhi. All right. Let's explain these three in a little bit and move towards a discussion on self-worth. I want to build up today a little bit. I know I don't have time, but just stay with me, inshallah. We're trying to get to a, a, a level, as I mentioned the first night and last night, where I want you to be confronted by today's materialism and consumerism and consumption and say, I'm going to walk away because I'm better than that. That's what I want for all of us. I never want you to be defined by the clothes on your back or the, or, or the car you drive. That attachment is what Islam places a red line. Achieve all you want, just don't attach. So he tells the angels that I'm going to create this human being with theme. It's important to know that animals also have theme in them. Birds have theme in them. The common factor in all this creation that you see is this dirt idea. So at the very lowest level, we're very, very similar to animals. They hunt, we hunt. They eat, we eat. They mate, we mate. They defend, we defend. They sleep, we sleep. And that's why sometimes in philosophy, and not, and not all the ulama accept this istilah, is that the insan is referred to as al haywan natiq Okay? A talking haywan, a talking animal. That's the first level. It's important for me to go through the levels. And then Allah says, وَإِذَا سَوَيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَوْ لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Okay? The tartib is very, very important. The sequence is very, very important. Then after that, I'm going to do what? I'm going to give him something called taswiya. Balance is one transition I've seen. Some, some take it from taswiya, some take it from surah. If it's tafasir, the balanced one is actually something that's very interesting if you ask me. That I'm giving this human being the ability to live a balanced life. Balance does not mean that you can stand on one leg without falling over. Let's go a little bit higher. Balance means this, this human being is so incredible, they can balance various antithetical qualities inside of them. Okay, the emotion and the intellect, for example. Rights and responsibilities, for example. Right? They're able now to control themselves to the point where I can do something, but should I do something? So between the power I have and the wisdom I have, there's a balance there. Just because I can throw myself in front of a moving train, I won't. My wisdom overpowers that. That balance is very, very important. The imams talk about balance up and down their ahadiths. Live in this world for one uh, for hundred years, live for the hereafter for one day. You've heard it all. Hope and fear, hope and urja, balance inside the heart. All of that is given inside the human being. You're able now to live a secular life by still being spiritual. That balance is inside of all of you. Not given to the angels or the jinn. That's second component. That the human being incredibly is able to live a balanced life. You can turn off switches, turn on switches, dim one down, right? Light one up. It's incredible how you're able to navigate through the various adventures and, and various avenues of life and balance everything in the process. That's you. The pinnacle is that Allah says, now I'm going to blow in him from my spirits. Ruhi. And that brings about a whole talk about the fitra, innate disposition, this God gene inside the human being, that we're all built with this essence of tawheed, that we understand that there is a supreme being, a sublime being. Allah has implanted that inside of us a pre-programmed software that tells us there's a higher being, a higher being. Now, who that higher being in, that we don't know. That's how we turn to the prophets and, and the imams. Right? The example we give often, uh, oftentimes in our, in, in, our, in our classes is that while a child knows it's hungry, it's up to you to tell it what to eat. So you don't teach it hunger. You teach the child how to fulfill that hunger. We're not teaching tawheed. We're teaching where to point that tawheed. Correct? That's why the, the, the prophets went up and down saying, that's not God, that's not God, that's not God. 900 years he spent, that's not God. Nabi Ibrahim broke idols, denied the stars, denied the moon, denied the sun, one by one. That's all he did, because that's all he could do. But forever, there's always been a debate, who's this higher power? And today, they have this itchiness to mention the G-O-D name. They'll call it science, they'll call it the universe, they'll call it spirituality, they'll call it whatever. They won't use the word God. 
I don't know why. They won't use God. Okay? But these three elements are extremely important. That's what makes a human being, unlike anything that's ever been seen before. The moment these three things happen, God says to the angels and the jinn, فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Now you do sajda. And you should know, and all of you, mashallah, the Ahl Quran, I'm talking to a very smart, smart crowd, mashallah, that whenever the Quran mentions people doing sajda, it's usually at a moment where they are blown away by something. Nothing short of a miracle. The magicians that were chosen by Pharaoh and Fir'aun, vetted by him, the best of the best in Egypt, to destroy Moses and Musa, when they saw that their, their, their snakes were devoured by his serpent, what happened? They found the sajda. When Ja'far al-Tayyar went to Abyssinia, the first you know, mission to spread the religion in Ethiopia, in front of this Christian ruler and begins now to narrate verses from Surah Maryam talking about Jesus the son of Mary the Quran talks about not only were there tears in his eyes but certain people now fell to the point where their face was, were on the dirt Sajda. when something like miraculous happens that's worthy of something like, as a reaction that reaction usually is Sajda. God says now this insan is now worthy of Sajda. not before these three this tartib again is extremely important. Teen, taswiya, ruhi. Incredible dirt where now there is an animalistic dimension inside all of us and that I think makes sense to all of you. There is this taswiya where you're able to balance things out and then of course there is this idea of a God gene. We have the ability to be God-like. I know Sayyid Hussein Mekki talked about this here, talked a little bit about that in JCC as well. God-like. What that means? A different ashra altogether. Don't have time tonight. These three now make up this incredible Ashraf al Makhluqat, this incredible creation of God, where he's so proud, so proud of his Khalaqiyat, he, he demands prostration. And that's why I mentioned yesterday when Iblis shunned that, when Shaitan, when Satan said no to that, that made Allah so angry that he removed him from his gardens. And we reduce that to just one mistake that shaitan made. I said by 4,000 years he worshipped God, but one mistake, kind of harsh of God. It's not the one mistake. It's the level of that one mistake. It's like saying, well, I shot him once. <laughs> but he's dead. What do you mean you shot him once? That's life imprisonment. Now these three are important because when Allah asked shaitan, why did you not do sajda in front of Adam? Why didn't you prostrate in front of Adam? He simply reduces the human being to one of the three. I'm fire, he's clay. But that was one third of it. What happened to Taswiya and Ruhi? Either he forgot or he lowered the human being to nothing but something physical. I need you, please. Something physical. Something physical. And Shaitan says, if that's the case, physically, I'm better than he is. And he took this grand plan of Allah, who laid it out beautifully, by the way, and reduced it to nothing. Something that's temporary, physical, be buried in the ground. There's so much more to the insan than this physical clay and dirt. Essentially, what you did, what Shaitan did, reduced the human being to the state of the animal. Understand, please. Ulama well, talk about this all the time. If we know that's what shaitan has done to us, because by extension, that's what he does to us, right? His promise to misguide us wasn't just that one Adam, it was all the sons and the daughters of Adam, meaning you and I and our kids as well. He's made a promise, I'm going to ambush them on the path. When that happens, when shaitan reduces the human being to just something that's physical, Allah now becomes angry, removes him now from, as you know, from the gardens and sends him down to earth with Adam and Eve, with Adam and Hawa. Why do I mention this? It's because when we cling ourselves to this materialistic be a world, when we actually believe that my worth 
is actually attached to the clothes that I wear, the car that I drive, the house that I own. And some of you might think, well, Asabai, we don't do that. Well, we might do it subconsciously, or we might do it consciously. We have this incredible race against each other when it comes to now, you know, um, who can outspend the other. If you went to this trip on, on, on your Christmas break, we're going to go to this trip on Christmas break. We go to someone's house, they invite us for dinner, and we take mental pictures of their bathroom, their driveway, their carpets, their, their cabinets. On the way home now, we download those pictures mentally, and we talk about that with our spouse all night long. And we grab the good old credit card, and we charge, and we charge, and we charge. Outdo them, and then invite them over, mashallah. So let me show you how to, how to have an actual party. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hosts us, He says, oh, by the way, I want you to reduce your consumption to the point where no food or no water from Fajr and Maghrib. Look at the difference. It's quite incredible. You look at the Sharia, as a side note, the Sharia that we're asked to follow. Allah obviously is telling us you have to travel beyond this world. There are things I'm asking you to do that are counterproductive in this materialistic world. For example, khums. Khums. What is Allah saying essentially? Save. After one year, once you have a good amount of savings, give away 20% of it. Don't invest it. Give it away. Give half to this Sadat family. Give the other half, let's say, to the house of the seminary, some project, some center. It's not yours anymore. 20% of it. Tell me one bank, one financial planner, one agent of yours, some guy running your finances. Sit there and tell you, oh, by the way, you've worked so hard to save? Yeah, good. 20% of that, give it away. He'll never say that. God's saying, look, this is something beyond this world. Your success doesn't lie in this materialistic world. It lies beyond this world. Why did I bring the whole idea of shaitan up? Because when shaitan does that, we become angry. It angers Allah. But yet we do that with ourselves all the time. We lower ourselves to nothing but an animal sometimes. There are people who eat, sleep, work, repeat all day long. Eat, sleep, go to school, repeat all day long. Is there a purpose? I don't know. They kind of go through the motions. They graze when they're hungry. They hunt when, they're, when, when the fridge is, is empty. They attack when they're angry. Have you seen people who have no purpose at all? The tongue goes. Decisions go. There's no sort of, you know, that, that jahiliya era is all there. And that's becoming prevalent, I'm sorry, in our families. A lot of what our broken homes resemble is because of the idea we've reduced ourselves to nothing but a haywan. That theme, that dirt that God says is a very basic level. And all we're worried about is food and shelter when actually there is something that's higher to, run, to, to return back to that ruhi phase, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. So we can't see ourselves as shaitan saw us. We have to see ourselves as Allah saw us. Someone who's worthy of his khilafat. Someone who's worthy of his vicegerency. Somebody who can achieve that level. Now mind you, right now it's bil quwa, you have to make it bil fi'il. Right now it is at the stage of, let's say for example, potential, you have to actualize that potential by becoming godlike. Because one of the things that shaitan will do best, he will play with your self-worth. He'll convince you you're not worthy of God's worship. And one of the biggest crises we have today in the faith is the issue of self-worth. I just don't think, Malana, that God wants to hear from me. I don't believe that he will forgive my sins. Surah Ali Imran talks about the muhsineen. The muttaqeen and the mu'mineen, very quickly. When describing the muttaqeen, after the obvious qualities, they follow Allah, they follow the Prophet, they protect themselves against the hellfire, then they say, 
with surat, with speed, they traveled towards the, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So hadith I mentioned in someone's house last weekend. I want to share with, you, with, with all of you as well. To understand how God wants to destroy shaitan. When this verse was revealed, now I want you to imagine for a second. Those are with me, inshallah? I'm talking a lot, I think. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, sorry. When this verse was revealed that God says the mu'mineen, the muttaqeen, these are pious ones. God's calling these people the muttaqeen, not me. God's saying these are pious people. My definition is quite small. You have a beard, mashallah muttaqeen That's it. <laughs> How he is inside the home, who knows? She pinned her hijab right? Yaar, mu'mina, mu'mina, mu'mina. God has a, a different criteria. Then he says, these are the same people that with surat, with speed, they travel towards the maghfiratim min rabbikum, the forgiveness from their Lord. The moment that this verse was revealed, alama taba tabai tisid al-mizan, says that shaitan climbed a mountain in Mecca and let out a shriek of anguish. It's a very powerful hadith. Up until that moment, he thought, if I can lure the human being to sin, I'm successful. Now he's found out, whoa, 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 whoa. I'll convince the, the human to sin, but now God's saying, oh, by the way, when you're convinced to sin, come back to me, the door's always open. It's like, oh, come on, man. Come on. I just convinced him to sin. Now you're being all nice about this. So you're going to forgive him. And these are not the kuffar, the munafiqeen, these are people who are the mu'mineen, the muttaqeen, the muhsineen in Surah Ali Imran, that they now will come towards Allah and, and, and inshallah Allah will be there waiting for them. So he was dejected, he was upset, he was debilitated. And that shriek does what? Cause all his shayateen, his little minions, to come and gather. Hadith says Imam Sadiq, gather. And now shaitan calls what? As I call it, the AGM of shayateen. Just yelling, they're screaming, just like our AGMs, yelling, screaming, crying. Same idea. <laughs> Says, have you seen this new verse? God's saying for those who are the pious ones, they can come back to me, I'll forgive them. Now what do we do? I have an idea, I have an idea. He says, no, no, bad, forget it, no. Anybody else? One guy says, I have an idea. Let's forget focusing on the sin, please. And let's make them hopeless in the tawbah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's make them believe that, yeah, yeah, these verses are for who? The muttaqeen. Baba, you're not the muttaqeen, man. <laughs> this is for people who are good. You're not a good person. This is not for you. If we can do that, he says, at the AGM, then we've done something. So not only are we going to lure him towards sin, we're going to convince him this sin is unforgivable. So don't bother going back to God. How many of my kids I'm, of, of my youth listening online on, in that building here, how many of us have convinced ourselves that my sin is heavier than God's mercy? I would say a lot. I get emails, paragraphs and paragraphs of people saying, I can't go back to God. He won't open the door for me. I've done too much, you have no idea. And that's when shaitan plays with your self-worth. Makes you believe that, yeah, you might be a Christian of God, but you're the last person he wants to hear from. How could you do that? Have a night of sin, then Fajr hits Allah Akbar. What is Allah greatest? What do you mean by that, Allah greatest? Greater than your sin of that the whole night you had last night downtown Toronto. Allah's great, greater than that. Greater than, th th than that song, than this woman, than that drug, than this. Really, you claim Allah is the greatest? Hypocrisy. If I were you, I would avoid, avoid. Right? Your father says, come home by midnight. You come home at 1230. 1230. And if you knew, if you knew my father, you knew my father wouldn't, wouldn't lay a hand on us. Never laid a hand on us. But he had those eyes. Ya Allah. Six foot four man. 
And sometimes he would, he, he knew that we were late. He would, <laughs> and God bless his soul, he'd place his chair right in front of the front door. So here we are sneaking, right, making sure the keys don't rattle, open the door, and bam, right there in front of us. Sometimes he'd fall asleep. Not me, my brothers. Wallahi, not me and my brothers. Please pray for them, inshallah. Please, I ask you. So my brothers would sneak upstairs. I'd be asleep at 10 o'clock. In the morning, on Saturday morning, we would wake up and we'd ask, where's dad? Dad's in the kitchen. It's breakfast time. So we would go anywhere but the kitchen. Because we know that dad knows that we were late last night. He was asleep, but it's dad. They have this six, seven, eight cents. We know exactly what time you came home last night. So we'll avoid, avoid dad the entire day. Hopefully, he'll get busy in his day. He'll forget about it. He'll soften, blah, blah, blah. That's exactly what shaitan does to us when it comes to God. You break his rules. You break his commands. You do all this. And then you have the gall to go to the mahrab on the musallah. Avoid, avoid, avoid to the point where like, yeah, it's better this way. Shaitan plays with your self-worth. And in doing so, he takes your worth and he convinces you and I that forget God, if you just possess these things, you're worthy of something. You have the respect of, of, of the peers around you. You're at least at par with the Joneses. If they're in Switzerland right now, or they're, let's say, right now going to every year to Arba'in, or they have, you know, they've just ordered this car, or they, in this market, they have this house, you can also do that. That's your worth. Forget God for a moment. Let's spend, overspend, overconsume, overcharge, drown in debt, but hey, you have the respect of your peers. And we attach ourselves for that sinking ship. All because shaitan does what? Plays with our self worth, convinces you and I we're nothing but clay. And God says, you're better than that. I gave you three things. All three things makes you what? The highest being there is. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. So we have to work on our self-worth. How do we do that now? One quick way is, go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Start with the smallest step. If that means some small dhikr, if that means whenever you have a free tongue, you send a salawat, or you ask Allah for forgiveness, or you do something, whatever dhikr you can do. I'm not asking you for long, long nights and all day fasting. No, Baba, one step is enough. You just have to show God a little bit of taqwa, piety. He'll open up the doors for you. Let him do the rest, but give him a bahana, man, an excuse. Just start the process. Just take that one step, he'll do everything else. It sounds very cliche. But I've seen it in my life, I've seen it in others' life. If you can't get to the Quran, open the Quran, read one verse, close it, put it away. 50 verses, one juz, baba, a be name, a little bit. Start with one verse. Try to make those moments where you're traveling, you're commuting, you're on the go train, school is starting now, you're commuting, you're at a red light, let's say, for example, everything now is on your phone. As opposed to watching monkeys eat strawberries, open your Quran app. Those are cute videos, by the way, very cute videos. They're adorable. But one, one verse, and then two verses, and your worldview changes. You start to believe you're worthy again. You're climbing back up the ladder. Just one stall. To what? To resume or to regain your worth again. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad, please. And that's why this dhulm done on the women of Imam Hussein is so detrimental for us. We can't fathom the idea. You want to fight against men on the day of Ashura in a battlefield with swords and weapons, fine. But dragging women of the Holy Prophet through the bazaars of Kufa and Sham, watching them as rocks are being hurled at them, foul words are being hurled at them. I mean, tomorrow night, we remember the, 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 the four-year-old daughter of Imam Hussein. But the one now who witnesses all of this, who's given the laqab of Umm al-Musa'ib. The mother of all musibat is Bibi Zainab. I say it constantly. I don't know if we can recognize the azamat of this woman. 
the irfanic nature of this woman. Ra ma ra'aytu illa jamila is an irfanic statement. I saw nothing but beauty on the day of Ashura. Men can't make that statement on the day of Ashura. Men ran from that uh, b- battlefield. And all she saw was the beauty of Allah on that day of Ashura. And let me, let me remind all of you of a couple of things of Zainab. Something about her musibah that brings comfort to the heart, at the same time brings this discomfort also to the heart. She saw things that Hussein didn't see. She experienced things that Hussein didn't experience. Imam Hussein never saw one body being trampled. Imam Hussein never saw one body being trampled. Do we understand that sometimes in the Masaib of, of, of Jabi Qasim, what was it that caused Imam Hussein and Abu Fazl Abbas to roar into the battlefield the way that they did to the point where what the enemies believed that they were coming to attack them? One Makhta says the Qatil of Janabi Qasim lifted his sword up and about to behead the son of Imam Mustaba. Hussein and the mere thought and the sheer idea that maybe Qasim's mayat might, might be beheaded. He ran so fast into the Maidan of Karbala, they thought he was coming to what? To attack them. The horses now are everywhere. Janabi Qasim's body is on the ground. Just the sheer thought, Hussein, of somebody beheading your nephew and this Jalal comes about, ask the heart of Zainab, one by one now, the boys are being trampled now, where you yourself are being trampled, Umar bin Saad says, I want 10 different horses to change their hooves, 5 on one side of Hussein, 5 on the other side of Hussein, on Umar bin Saad's command, the 5 horses to the right, would ride to the left, the 5 from the left, would ride to the right, one Mal'oon says, by Allah, when my horse trampled Hussein's body. I could hear the cracking of his ribs. Hussein never saw any of that. Hussein never saw one beheading. Not one beheading. But Zainab watched as her own Muhammad were beheaded. As Abbas was beheaded. As Hussein was beheaded. Hatta as six month old Ali Azgar was beheaded. This was the same Zainab. In Kufa she was a Shahzadi. She was raised in Kufa by her father Ali. Whenever he wanted to teach the women of Kufa. He would not go himself. He would send Zainab. He would send Zainab. The women of Kufa saw Zainab as a what? As a revered figure, a respected woman. Now this same Zainab now, years later, is entering the Kufa, the, the bazaar of Kufa, tied up as a prisoner on animals without saddles. My salams to you, Mul Masaib. You were the one now that took Imamat from Karbala to Kufa, Kufa to Sham. The same, Kar- the same Zainab, Ittama Sidua, the same Zainab that when she entered the plains of Arba'een, she went straight towards the grave of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. The Makta says that she collapsed herself on that grave, picked up the Khak of Karbala. Hey, bhaiya, I had this comfort in my heart. Why, Zainab? For the first time in a long time, I can cry over your mayat without somebody whipping me or lashing me at the same time. I have this preoccupation, this worrisome in my heart. What are you worried about, Zainab? On the day of Ashura, my bhaiya Hussein asked me for two things. In namaz's shop, don't forget me, ya bhaiya. Number two, I'm leaving you my four-year-old amanat. Take care of her if you can. That's my sakina. She doesn't, doesn't sleep at night unless she's on my chest. Hey, bhaiya Hussein, I did the one, but the other one is Sakina, I left in the Zindan of Sham. Matame Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein.